Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Great. You can on the back end. I'll see you with your glass of wine. <laughs> so I'm very jealous. So I, I selected this talk because um, at, at some point in, in, in my group, in my division, we try to assemble what is it that we do really. And um, it will come to you very clear later on at the end because I've got a small video to show you. And I actually presented a similar talk like this in the Philippines and also in the United Arab Emirates to younger scholars uh, who are actually interested in, in renewable energy. And I felt it's really quite enticing to see what the uh, sort of feedback that I get from these in relation to, um, in relation to the things that I, I mentioned here. So it's not academically challenging if you're interested in some uh, Fourier transforms or basically some of the equations. It's not academic. It's actually perhaps enlightening to tell you what it's all about and actually how it links up not only to the scales of the energy systems that we're looking at, but also to society. And this is where I'm going to start with. So first thing is about development. There's a list of things about development that's given up there. It's about how you go through a process to allow you to progress further. And that development to me is actually a key to what we do in everything in life, okay? And if you think in terms of what the United Nations, the UNDP, wrote about development, then this is the, the diagram that actually been uh, highlighted in the 2015 report that they have. And you can see in here, it's the directly enhancing human capabilities and also human development. And if you go further out here, you can see knowledge. So we are exchanging knowledge now. And we're also consuming and energy, right? So every bit in that torus, every bit in those circles that you see in there, actually requires energy. Whatever you do, actually does require energy. You go for a coffee and talk to somebody else in front of you, you consume energy because you're talking, you also walk to that place and so on. So energy is underpinning everything that we do in human development. That's really the message that I'm trying to say. It's so important that those people who don't have energy should get it. Otherwise, the development will not get any further. And then we've got this other issue in relation to growth. So we develop and then we grow. And some elements of work being done in relation to growth in, in the planet uh, aspect of it, and that we are consuming here, a society consuming about the resources of two and a half or three planets. Okay? Yet we have regulations, we have targets, we have aspirations that we should go and be sustainable and go from three planets living to one planet living. It's actually very difficult. It's extremely difficult to, to do this. And there's a lot of work being done to try to see how close can we get to this, especially around cities. And I'll talk about cities in, in, in a minute. So. Because it's difficult, it has to have in it our aspirations. It also has to have in it equity. We cannot have somebody consuming about 20 times or 15 times that of somebody else in the other side of the planet. So we need that equity. What is it that we're going to lose? Okay, so the difference between those two diagrams is basically we lost some bit of the transportation that we have. Okay, but we are quite ingenious, we are human beings, we are ingenious about doing things well. And that, uh, um, that activity of us as humans may allow us to use what we have now as long as we do it sustainably. And energy plays a major role into that. So if we can produce all the energy required sustainably, then we can still fly our planes, we can still use our cars and so forth. So we can actually reduce our consumption by thinking seriously and out of the box to get more sustainable. So how do we get there? And I think my talk about energy, energy at scales, is quite interesting in relation to this. The next item I want to talk about is population growth. And here's the indication about where we're going in terms of uh, population on this planet. And you can see it 
going out from uh, 746 million um, in the early 50s up to 3.9 billion 2014 and it's heading on to 6.4 billion by 2050. And this growth indicates that 2.5 billion will actually be in the planet more than what we have now. And the growth is coming out from places like Asia and Africa, Nigeria, for example, China, and so forth. And then we've got urbanization. If you look at um, Europe, for example, Latin America, North America, and also Oceania, uh, Oceania wherever it is we have it here, uh, then these are already at the 80% scale of uh, um, urbanization, okay? That has its own problems, and energy will be one of those problems that we need to get it to those urbanization centers in a sustainable way. And if you look at Africa, it's going to head on to 60 or 64% by 2050. And then we have another other notion of climate change and the origins of some of the climate change coming in from energy. You know this guy? Right, so you know Mark Carney is the chairman or the whatever it is of Bank of England. And what does he what does it have to do with climate change? Okay, somebody like him should be just interested in finance. And this is a twenty fifteen article in the FT in Financial Times where he indicated that people should be looking at stranded assets in terms of energy. Okay? So if we had the climate change negotiation, this is just before the Paris Agreement, that we should be looking at two degrees centigrade at most, maybe 1.5 degrees centigrade. That means people who are actually in the fossil fuel industry, they'll have stranded assets. Because as you can see from the graphics here, the amount of resources that we have in terms of um, gigaton of carbon dioxide is about 1,500. And if you want to stay at 2 degrees centigrade, you can only spend about 225 of those. So you'll have, as a company who are working in fossil fuels, you'll have stranded assets. So what happened in relation to this? People thought, oh, he's just a fanciful person. He's, he's not going to go any further about it. But you look at the, what, the meeting that happened in Davos recently and look at what's happening in relation to what these companies are doing. And recently, in December, a year after that, he, he still got that banner of actually doing something about it because he's worried financially and economically about people who are supporting our pensions that will have, they'll have these stranded assets. And he wants to have disclosures in relation to what they do about the environment and the carbon emissions. Right? We universities will have to do this. I know because I have some work to do in my university in relation to what our carbon emissions will be and how we're going to deliver the, the, the Paris Agreement in relation to our um, state in, in the university. So it will come also to us, not just to companies who have to do this. But there are other people who say he is just um, uh, romantic. And it's not going to happen because of the short-termism in the city. I quite agree, there is a lot of short-termism around. But then you have the evidence around you in terms of hurricanes, in terms of floods and so forth. People will think about what to do. So you've got the financial people thinking about climate change. So I want to bring this back to you closer to here. So do you know where this is? Right? Okay, so there you go. You've got, you got your, your Swansea, uh, Swansea Bay. And this is the, 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 the sea level rise projection as a function of temperature. Okay, so you've got a no zero degrees temperature rise. This is what the bay is, what it is now perhaps. If you go to one degree temperature rise, you can see where the uh, floods in the water go into. And you go further, two degrees and four degrees. Okay, so when you see things coming closer to home, you understand what it's all about. Okay, if the projections are doing the same thing for Southampton, because we also got water around us, and the council is very worried about what happens in relation to this. What are the plans, not only for the five years, 20, 50 years in relation to this? And these are projection based models, which are validated by academics and so forth. So, climate change and its impact are very important, so we need to think about that. We also got national targets. 
So we got targets to reduce our emissions by 2050 by 80% from 1990 levels. And if you look in terms of where you need to reduce them, okay, you need to reduce them perhaps to me is in, in, the, in the urban environments. And this is really where energy at scale is also important. The 76% of consumption is in, in the urban environments and that's really where we need to address it. Then we have the Climate Change Committee, which is related to the Climate Change Act, which actually stipulated the 80% reductions. And you've got the carbon budgets, which the government have to sign up to those. And they already signed up to the carbon budget for, whoops, and now they are trying to sign up to carbon budget five. So these targets, irrespective of what we have done is sign up to in Paris, they are embedded in our legislation much more than actually having the in international climate change negotiations that we had in Paris. So we have that embedded in our legislation, so we need to do something about it here and now in the UK. And then going down now to our energy and the profiles of the energy that we have, and this is the projection, this is actually what we have spent in terms of consumption in our energy in 2013. And you can see as a little bit coming out from renewables, now we've got more on that. For example, 20% of our electricity now is coming from renewables. But then we've got this here, 31% of losses. So for each 100 units that we put in, we, we, we actually lose about 33% of that. And that's something quite, to me, for engineers and scientists, is a real opportunity to see how we can go around to reduce that in relation to the consumption, in relation to utilization and so forth. And you can go further, and actually these are opportunities rather than actually something that we should moan about. These are opportunities to understand and think about in relation to our <coughs> next generations, how we get that into our students and so forth. And those opportunities will create jobs, no doubt about it. So you can think about the whole industrial reduction in terms of efficiency, industrial processes, University campuses being greener and so forth. And you can see those opportunities coming around. And in terms of our drivers for the UK, I already mentioned uh, um, the Climate Change Act, which is basically 80% by 2050. There are also the EU target, which we will still be within the EU targets until 2020 maybe or something like that. And that means 15% of our energy, not just electricity, coming from renewables. And then if we have, and this is basically why you have energy now uh, being implemented within the same department as industrial strategy and also business, then you need to have uh, a promotion of what we do in here in terms of our knowledge, in terms of our impacts in relation to the new innovative products and so forth for the market and for export. But currently, in relation to the UK government uh, policy in relation to delivering this 80% target, is about decarbonizing the power sector. Okay? And one of the major pillars of this is uh, wind energy, especially offshore. What's the other pillar? Nuclear. So nuclear energy is the other pillar for, for, for doing this, right? But there is a third pillar which the politicians are not thinking and talking about. They are actually thinking about it, but not talking about it because there are no votes in there. There's nothing for them to go and cut ribbons to open up big power plants. In it. And that's energy efficiency. And to me, this is really where we can win a lot in energy efficiency. That's where the Germans are doing a lot. But in terms of renewables, it's a huge investment, about 200 billion in relation to delivering on that target now that we already have in place. There's also other technologies like marine renewables that could also deliver at a large scale, okay, compared to offshore wind. We are surrounded by huge resources in the UK that we could utilize to deliver that in renewables. I can also mention solar. And I remember a story where we have negotiated a, a company called Sharp, Actually, somewhere not too far away in Wrexham, right? They have a factory in Wrexham. I remember at the negotiating stage with Sharp in Japan, they told us why you wanted to have solar in the UK. You don't have much sunshine, <laughs> right? 
And I said, yes, I quite agree. But if you look at the south of the UK, there is enough sunshine in there, perhaps similar to that in Japan. And you have a major program in Japan. Anyway, to cut a long story short, they sign up this agreement to, to have 10 megawatts of a plant at Rexon, which went up to 400 megawatts. Okay? Where did the, those panels go? They didn't go to Africa. They went to the market in Germany. Okay? And for us UK now, we have 9 gigawatt of solar photovoltaic installed in the UK, right across the UK. That's a huge development for us to have, in spite of our reduced resource in solar. So I'll be going through solar later on. So I'll start with looking at ocean energy. I'll then think about wind energy, I think, then solar, and then perhaps energy for development. And I'll take you through those at those scales required. So in terms of ocean energy, there are various energy conversion technologies you can have. There is OTEC, which is um, the conversion of uh, temperature difference and a column of water using heat exchangers. There's a salinity gradients, which is basically the diffusion between um, uh, salt water and, and um, fresh water. And you have uh, osmosis, uh, electricity produced by osmosis. And then you've got tidal range. You've got tidal barrages. And this is um, a video, which I hope will work. So this is the Sewa project in Korea, which I visited about two years ago. And this is a barrage, it's the biggest barrage around in the world, 256 megawatts, which is about four megawatts more than Laurent's. Right? And they had to make it four megawatts more to have the title of being the biggest in the world, right? So I don't know what happened to the computer, nevertheless. So that's that. And then you've got the wave energy. What we know about wave energy is just basically the movement of the waves that you convert it into some useful energy. And then you've got tidal stream energy, which is the movement in the sea that you to utilize in the same way as you wind turbines utilize air to generate power. And I'll talk only about the last two, otherwise we'll be here all night. So ocean energy, there is the potential first around the, the global potential for this, and this is about tidal global potential, which is about 0.5 terawatts. And currently the world consumption electricity is about what, 14, 15 terawatts? So it's really very small compared to what the world actually consumes. And then the wave potential is uh, 3 terawatts, and you can see these points where it's highest. And then the uh, OTEC, which is ocean thermal energy conversion, it's really quite interesting around, um, that, um, uh, around the equator and so forth. Philippines, for example, they're really interested in this and, and they're trying to exploit it. So these are the real resources that you see. Uh, the people I said, these are the extractable resources that we could utilize with our technologies. Then, in terms of tidal energy, I've got some, uh, some um, videos to show you here. I don't think the, the sound is connected. So I'll play it without sound silently. So this is the open hydro, which is quite an innovative device, which is an un unusual compared to the one that we're used to in relation to horizontal axis turbines or vertical axis turbines. And I'm trying to find out how I can, how can actually do the power factor, how can I do the, um, <coughs> the, um, the coefficient of performance for this turbine and so forth. And then we've got things like wave energy. And I have this here because I think it's quite of the most interesting aspect of wave energy to look at the challenges that we face in wave energy and this is a device that was and it was was produced or created okay to be safe within that 50 or 100 year storm of wave energy and that's the plumes which doesn't exist anymore and that's actually it's cylinders joined together and then you have a conversion between the cylinders doing that so what we're thinking about here, what we're talking about is that large active structures in the sea, 
They are challenging in terms of the way we deploy them, the way we make them stay where they are, because the sea is a very harsh environment for them. And they are currently in mature technology and lack ex operational experience. Okay? But that's where wind energy was before. That's where quite a lot of the technologies that we came through before. So it's actually a step in our progression to do it. So we shouldn't be shy of actually not, not trying to go ahead with it. For wave energy, here is the resource. So you can see the UK is at the end of a long fetch in the Atlantic. You can see about 70 kilowatt per meter, not per meter square. So a huge resource for us in the UK. And if you want to delve into what is it that are, what are the parameters that are important for it, it's basically the wavelength, the wave height, uh, and also the, the period that are really important to quantify it. And the power is just related to uh, the amplitude um, uh, square and also the period. Okay? And you can see a bit about waves um, uh, as you go along in terms of height. And these are driven by wind in any case and wind is also driven by solar. So you've got wave and wind and so forth coming up from the But these are normalized monochromatic waves that uh, people play around with. Uh, but we know that wave energy is really related to irregular patterns in terms of uh, wave amplitude and phase and direction. And there is also the ability of these scales and hurricanes that we have to make sure that the devices um, uh, um, withstand these. And the power, peak power is generally available in deep water, so you have to be away from shore for a long distance. The other two challenging things, the first one is that you're talking in terms of very small um, periods of the waves, which basically give you about a 0.1 frequency. Okay? And we know our frequency here in, in our electricity is about 50 hertz, so you need to have transformation of those frequencies in the sea into something to 50 hertz, so quite a lot of power electronics needed, and so forth. And there are also challenging things because there are many devices in there. For example, in terms of um, uh, tidal energy, you probably think about um, um, horizontal axis turbines, you say people like this, and perhaps you, you need to think about vertical axis turbines. Well, wave energy, there are many devices, uh, and that makes it very difficult to, to see which is going to be the winner. So here are some of the devices. I'll just flick through them. The various technologies. Okay. So going now to tidal energy. And that's basically around the flow in the, in the sea. Currents and streams of flows in the sea rather than the tidal range. So why tidal energy? It's because it's predictable and actually depends on the gravitational mm -hmm. motion uh, of the moon and the earth and so forth. It's not weather related, so you know how predictable it is in the next 20 minutes and so forth. It can have a, if you're actually developing a site and a project, it can have a better power contract, purchase power contract with the utilities and so forth. And it is related to the capture area as well as the velocity cube. So it's very sensitive to the velocity that you are doing in, in the site. Of course, the density as well. And our resource in the UK um, is roughly about 40 terawatt hours, according to some reports, per year. And that's about 10% of the UK, roughly 10% of the UK consumption, current consumption of electricity. So utilizing it will be quite interesting and important. And that's why the government had incentives, quite a lot of big incentive really, at the early stages uh, of tidal energy, which we, can, we do not, as a community, we did not really capture because we have promised so much before we were ready. Okay? Really, we promised so much before we were ready. And I can show you books and books about targets that we can have by <coughs> 2020, which are just unimaginable. Nevertheless, we're still here and we should carry on with it. <coughs> The other thing about uh, all the renewables that we have, except for solar, is that in the UK at least, these renewables are too far away. So this is the, 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 the map for the resource for tidal energy in the UK. And you can see here, we've got quite a lot in the Pentland Firth, a lot around Isle of Wight and the Channel Islands. Of course, around here you have got a lot, right? 
uh, and so forth. But they are all away from the major urban centers, away from where the grid is as well. So a huge investment needs to be done to bring those to the urban centers and to the grid. And there was some talk at some point, uh, there will be um, uh, a seabed electricity cable, DC cable going out to these major centers to join up both the wave and tidal and also uh, the wind energy. That will be about half a billion in cost apparently at the time, but now it's probably going to be doubled. But that has got, has stopped. So commercialization for tidal energy, um, these are the, uh, the initial, the big turbines in terms of a megawatt and so forth which are done by a company called Atlantis, which actually now bought everything that's around. Uh, one megawatt to 1.5 megawatt. These are the current other devices. This is a, a device by a company called TGL, which is bought by Rolls-Royce, and then acquired by Alstom, and then sold to GE, and now has been one of the devices to be done in the, um, um, in the French program and so forth, for 500 to about 1.4 megawatt for these devices. This is how, the, how it evolved. And then you got uh, the Scots Renewables, started by 250 kilowatt, and went up now to two megawatts. Huge device. Uh, it's actually a floating device rather than anchored device. This is the big uh, structure for it. And then you can have these smaller ones, um, uh, divided 100 kilowatt by this company called Nova. Actually, the first array, three of these devices have been installed in the Orkneys. Okay, small actually is better to allow us to understand what's what. And then you've got uh, things which is innovative, coming up to something to reduce the cost because you don't want to pile them into the sea. You want them to be floating, perhaps anchored by ropes or chains. So this is a platform done by Sustainable Energy, uh, marine, sustain, sustain, uh, marine Sustainable Energy, Sustainable Marine Energy rather, at, uh, at the Isle of Wight. It's got two turbines, shuttle turbines, 100 100 kilowatt and will be tested at EMAC. And then you've got the, the core mart, which is uh, Nutricity, 0.5 uh, megawatt, 500 kilowatts, which is being prepared as we speak now to be deployed next month into um, um, EMAC in, in, um, in Scotland. So moving towards commercialization for first generation devices and second and third generation. So second and third generation are those devices are actually reducing the cost. And those that are not utilizing quite a lot of the first generation, which is basically piling them into the sea. Although the first array, which was input, which is put into the, the Orkneys in November, uh, two, three now, three turbines at uh, the Atlantis site and by Majan, they're actually piled into the ground. So here we go. Most of the devices I mentioned are prototype technologies, except uh, the ones I mentioned about the arrays. Uh, now, they're still being tested and further tested than needed, and that's why we had huge centers, test centers at EMAC and other places around the world to allow this testing to be done. Now I'll go to wind energy. How am I doing with time? <laughs> Going to wind energy. So here's the wind map. I'm not going to spend a lot on this. You can see the picture on it I convey here is that we in the UK have got a huge resource in terms of wind energy. And actually it's the same thing. The, the equation, the governing equation is the same one as for tidal stream energy, proportional to the cube velocity and the capture area. And what we need to do is to, to measure before you have a wind farm, you need to measure and understand and maybe try and capture those characteristics of the site into the design of your array, how you position inside those turbines. So it's evolution. So this is a program called Down Wind, which is um, started sometime about 1978. Okay, 30 million uh, euros at the time, I think, no euros at the time. And it was looking at turbines of four megawatts. Okay, it's about 30 years, more than 30 years, okay? More than 30 years before we got the first two megawatt turbine that we're looking at this. So this program, which also had the single rotor turbines and dual rotor turbines, okay? Actually produced enough material to allow people to build on it. And we were in the UK at the heart of it. 
unfortunately, we didn't have a, a very, uh, what you call it, a helpful government, and we have to give it away to the Danes. So the Danes took everything and ran away with it. So, but wind energy, you can get it also from the watt to the megawatt. So you can have a wind turbine on your house, provided that it, you have a resource, before, before, provided it's windy, okay? So by the sea, by the coast, or maybe a mm -hmm. farm, then you have it. If it's in the city and the resource is lower, our results shows that you will actually be Produce, it'll, be, it'll actually be providing power for the turbine than actually gaining power from the turbine. Okay, because the inverter has to be tech, kept in uh, and so forth. So it's got to have the resource around that. And now we're looking at things like nine megawatts. Okay, so the first devices that were obtained at eight megawatts been installed, and now they are going up to extend to 9 megawatts. And now they're talking about 10 megawatt devices. So wind energy at scale from the kilowatt to the megawatts is now becoming quite uh, an interesting proposition for us to, to address that. And then we have got large structures like the London Arrays, the biggest, currently the biggest offshore wind, wind farm, 630 megawatts. Uh, I can see the footprint, 100 kilometers square. So it really takes a huge amount of the sea. And you can see the amount of investment that you need to have about 2.2 billion in relation to this. So you can look at how much it costs per turbine, per megawatt in relation to that. And the infrastructure that you need to have now for large wind farms. It's interesting, if you look just at the boats, you deploy the deployment of these turbines is really interesting and actually now resembling quite a lot of offshore wind, uh, offshore oil technologies, okay? And then the, the maintenance and, 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 uh, and so forth required by it needs specialized equipment and so forth. There are now um, drones that actually go across to perhaps spray the blades if there is some, some, some uh, reduction in, in some of the plates uh, which can profile, they spray them with some materials rather than actually get somebody to go by boat to do it. It's really quite interesting and amazing, exciting stuff happening around this. And this is the London RA and actually quite a lot of companies investing in like E.ON, people from the Middle East like Master and so forth. In terms of us for the UK, so historically we had, the, the, the way we got around our wind uh, energy program. We had something called rounds, which is basically tendering, um, um, tendering um, uh, schemes to say we will produce for you as a as a government or as a utility a certain amount of megawatt hours at this price. So we have round one, round two, and and then uh, round three. And you can see the amount of gigawatt that's been proposed under those uh, round one and two, and also. Uh, around three. And around three is nine zones, 32 gigawatts. Okay, it's really a huge amount. And here's the map where these things are. Okay? And now they're deploying at 1.2 gigawatt, which is actually a similar capacity to nuclear power plants. Of course, the power factor, the, power, the, the capacity factor is different, but there's similar capacities like this, right? And they're around these areas here for round three, which is basically uh, the hash, the yellow dash. And we're very sad that the one uh, farm that was very close to us were actually not given uh, permission to do that, actually about 900 megawatts of turbines, and it was rejected last June by the Secretary of State uh, to have it approved. Okay, so globally then we have companies that have, uh, not companies, we have Countries are actually competing who's going to have the highest amount of uh, wind installation. You can see Japan, sorry, Japan, China, USA, and so forth. That graph indicates that they are really going very fast with this. And basically, they're marching on in relation to these technologies because they know that they are the saviors for them in the future. Um, other places that are actually lacking in this are Africa, for example. Quite a lot of projects in Africa are lacking a lot. There's one or two projects which are supposed to be about at 200 megawatts actually stalled because of because of problems in relation to getting consent from the communities. They just came in, they grabbed the land, and the land belongs to tribal people, and they told them, no, you can't have it. So you have all these problems around in terms of that. 
So you need to get the community engaged from day one. And this is a very interesting graph to tell you about the projection for wind energy. Okay? See 2015, 63 megawatt installed. Okay? You see this dip as well in relation to the, uh, to the investment that they have. And here's the projection what will happen in 2015. So this is projections for 2015. In 2014, you can see the capacity is 53 megawatts. So it's gone up by about 10 megawatts. So they're always underestimating these capacities. Relationally. So I think offshore wind will really be a major uh, um, capacity, uh, increase in capacities around the world. So what are the prospects for this? So I mentioned the 9 megawatt uh, turbine with a 164 meter diameter turbine. This is really a 6 megawatt turbine. You can see it in relation to the airplane, uh, 380 and so forth, and the amount of air it takes. The blade technology that these people are doing, it's really one single mold to give you a whole length of 80 meter uh, turbine. The amount of technology and know-how <coughs> going into this and the way you also transport it, which is an amazing sight, and I wish I was there when this is being transported to take my own pictures. Okay, uh, so where are we going with wind energy? So wind energy we needs to go in relation to offshore um, down to deep water, okay? But there are limitations in relation to going to deep water because the current foundation technologies is not appropriate for this. So you need to have floating turbines. Here's a study done by the Energy Technology Institute, uh, and that indicates to you the type of uh, platforms that you're going to have. The thing that struck me is really the, the weight of these things. So look here, 11,500 tons of weight you're going to have in the sea. I can't see whether this will be competitive, really, with the current technologies to have that weight. Nevertheless, people are doing quite a lot of work on this. And what's really interesting, I, I just came back from last month from a, a meeting in uh, United Arab Emirates, Stat Oil, which is an oil company, they are investing in this. Because they see this level of stranded assets coming back to buy them and they need to bid. But remember, and I remember, well, I was still young then, but I remember the history about that. In, when solar technology was invented, early 50s, right? The majority of players in the solar industry, for solar photovoltaic, were actually oil companies, right? And they stayed on with it for about 10 to 20 years. And then they said, it's not going to go anywhere, and they left it. And then everybody just went on with it and, and carried on. And now they're trying to position themselves again into that. They, don't want, they want to be part of the activity and actions happening, and also to avoid these stranded assets. So now I'm going to the next level, which is the solar energy, okay? And here's the diagram <coughs> to show you the solar resource. Now you can see we are here. We are in the blue region. Basically, we're getting about 100, sorry, 1,000 kilowatt hours per meter square annum, okay, of radiation. If you go down to Africa here, it's actually about greater than about three times, two and a half times or three times. There's also the other uh, thing about solar energy, is its latitude dependence, we just mentioned. Okay, it depends where you are on, uh, on the planet. And the second thing that you need to think about is relation to its diffuse and direct sunshine. Okay, so Aden, where I come from, you can see there's a quite a lot of direct uh, radiation rather than diffuse. And you can see London here is more of a diffuse than direct. Okay, so there is some something of research that came around in relation to high latitude countries where the encapsulation for the solar cells could be perhaps optimized to allow you to take more of the diffuse rather than the direct sunlight and have been and hence have more yield than where you can have in relation to direct, uh, um, direct areas, direct places around the world. So that type of research is still going on in relation to optimizing solar cells. So what would, what would the, so this is, we're talking now about smaller scale solar energy, one kilowatt peak, which will cost you now <coughs> about 700 pounds, not 1.5 K, 700 pounds to be installed directly, not about eight uh, uh, <coughs> meters square. It will generate about quarter of the load over the year, 
of a UK three bedroom house. If you have the same kilowatt installed in Africa, for example, you can see it generates about the load of three, a uh, three quarter of the load of three bedroom homes that we have. So in a way, we should be investing somewhere where the resource is highest. And that's why you've got things like the Desert Tech program, where there is a, a, a group of uh, companies and perhaps uh, institutions trying to build up in North Africa solar arrays that can actually produce power, not only for Africa, but also pump it across uh, to Europe. So uh, here's how solar energy resource, I thought I should bang that in. It's basically solar, uh, the photons coming in, hitting a semiconductor device, creating a whole electron pair, uh, and then you have a separation of charge, and you connect it to an outside load, so you got power coming out of it. But the most interesting aspect of one need to think about is that you don't have this rated solar cells of about 1,000 watts per square meter at 25 degrees centigrade. You know, the level of radiation varies um, really from no radiation at all to uh, 1,000 watts per square meter. You may get that about 20 or 30 minutes a day here, for example, in the UK. But then you'll be operating out in these areas here with the level. The other thing you need to notice is that the voltage for a solar cell is fixed, about 0 0.5, 0 0.56 uh, volts, but the current varies according to the photons or the radiation come in. And that's why when you have a solar panel that's made up of many cells, because you add the voltages, and traditionally the voltage should be about 17 volts to charge up a lead acid battery. You calculate the number of cells. So from watts to megawatts in terms of solar, I don't know how many people have got um, calculators now, so it's actually in microwatts, maybe many milliwatts that you have, and utilizing the light that we have in here. Or you can have a solar light, that these kids have, you can have solar pumping, and these are professional applications basically for telecommunication where it's very difficult to take the fuel to go for your diesel generator. So you can have a combination of solar and wind if you wanted to and so forth. And these are mini grids applications. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But then you can have also some innovation coming in. So this is a, a delivery vehicle for perishable goods. Okay? So the, your, your refrigeration unit plus your diesel unit are in here. So what happens if you replace it with solar panels? Right? So, this is me, 1997, okay, we did this work for a company called Sainsbury's, everybody else knows who Sainsbury's is, and they actually built about four of these triggers to actually make it work. It works extremely well in the UK because when you need power, it's in the summer when you have <coughs> enough resource, when you don't need power, it's in the winter, so it's, everything works very well. Unfortunately, they franchised their delivery regime and then the project did not go any further than that. Nevertheless, it was really good. We had a few papers come out for that. But then you can have large scale, okay? So large scale means at the level of wind farms, at the level of combined cycle gas turbines, okay? So in the Middle East, in Chile, in other places around the world, in Spain, well, the last, last project that we signed up in the Middle East, 800 megawatt of photovoltaic um, solar cell sort of uh, project. Okay, that's connected directly to the grid. So you can have it from the watt to the megawatt in relation to photovoltaics. But for us in the UK, because we don't like to have land which could be producing food or allowed for recreation, maybe we should think about having photovoltaic in our buildings. This way you come building integrated photovoltaics. And here are some options that people could have, either integrated as the facade, or perhaps as a shading component, or a glazing integration, so you can have enough light to go, some light to go through and so forth, you still get power, and perhaps some skylight or atria that you, you could have. And this is really quite interesting. So these are projects that we have in our university that we done. Um, over the years with this. So this is 1997, the second installation after Northumbria University in the UK for a photovoltaic integrated facade. 
Uh, and these are social housing. Uh, this is also the, the university done recently, uh, 2006. Uh, and these things actually do allow us to show to our students about sustainability. Okay, we take them in the power plant. We actually show them what the inverters are, we show them what the batteries are. We tell them how you can look at designing and so forth. So that's part of the education for the younger generation. How about doing it across the city? Right? So this is my city, Southampton. I spend most of my life in Southampton, so I know quite a lot about it. This gives you an indication of how the city grown out from a, you know, sort of a, a perimeters in, in relation to time. And you can see quite a lot of new buildings that came up 1980 to the present, which actually expanded the city. And now we are really at the boundaries of it. Okay? But the city now have to think very seriously whether to have multiple occupancy, large uh, towers, and things like that, or actually stay where they are and don't allow more migration into the city. But it's surrounded by water, so we can have way, we can have, well, we can have way in Tadal, but we can have Tadal because of the port and things like that. But we can have solar panels in the water. We can have solar farms in the water. Okay? We can also have solar panels in the roofs. <coughs> so that is quite interesting. So when I mentioned this to our local authority, they said, why don't you try to do the study? So I said, okay, we did the study. So here's the solar map for the, for the whole of the city. And anybody support Southampton here? Just, Southampton just beat us the other day, didn't they? It's once it just beat us the other day. So this is the stadium, Southampton Stadium, and these are some buildings. You can see our simulation to indicate every 20 minutes where the shading will be in relation to one building next to the other, in relation to uh, vegetation or trees and so forth. So we did the mapping for this uh, to understand how much of a resource we can get. We had some criteria of how we, uh, we need to go something around 8 meters squared to be the minimum for that. So we looked at the solar radiation that's hitting the city. And we looked at the radiation received by the roofs. And we looked at where it's going to be applicable. So if you have roofs with chimneys, so we define each and every building in the city. Okay? All the information about it, even the height of the building and number of floors and so forth were done. And then we looked at ways of trying to see how we can integrate photovoltaics. So this is the commercial and the domestic buildings that are, um, that are in the city and how you, could, uh, how you can get. Okay, I've got quite a lot to go actually. All right, I'll go for it. So this is about the scale. So you've got roofs which are different areas, right? So you need to design your solar system to allow you to, to take advantage of these roofs. So you've got roofs of about three kilowatts, three to 15, and larger roofs. And you can see larger roofs and then domestic buildings, okay? The smaller ones are domestic buildings. So the most interesting thing to see and to capture the imagination of city authority is how much is the actual installed capacity and how much would that give to the city in terms of displacing its energy demand, electricity demand or energy demand. So 240, uh, sorry, uh, 258 uh, megawatts could be installed in the roofs of Southampton, okay? And Southampton consumption, 2011, is about uh, 10,000 megawatt hours, actually now slightly less than that because of energy efficiency that they have. And we estimate that 25% of that could come from photovoltaics installed on the roofs. Obviously, it's not coming in one go, it's coming over the whole year, okay? Now, you think about this. Could you combine that with storage? Maybe at the street level or maybe the district level. And storage is becoming cheaper now. And then you play around with smart grid, and you play around time, time of use tariffs. And if you are really an investor, you will be in that position now to actually utilize this, and because we know it's going to come in the, in, in the future. So the last bit I'm going to talk about is something that actually made me understand why academia should think very seriously about thinking about the impact of their research. And this is looking at energy access in developing countries. Okay? I've seen, I've been to so many conferences on solar photovoltaics. 
that you see, you can actually measure the number of papers, the number of PhDs go there, but you can see the, you can't see the impact. Okay? The impact for us in developed countries, we have the grid, so we don't really need to have photovoltaics on the roofs, but though we want to displace our fossil fuels, we need to have that. That's really where it's going to be developed. And this is really about how you provide services to people who are really living in poverty and living subsistence lifestyles. 1.2 billion around the world will have this. Okay? And how do we bring the, this access to them? And to me, having access really transforms lives okay, in relation to everything you do. And access could be just a solar panel and lighting. Okay? But then we need to have productive use access. Okay, where you can generate businesses, you can generate uh, 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 what you call it, commercial activities and so forth. So here are six mini grids that we have installed over the last four years in Africa. Okay, these affect about 14,000 people. And those mini grids are done to connect, to invigorate. First, we, we understand what a village is. village is about to die and so forth, and people are migrating out of it. So we look at that and we see this requires something to change it. We go and visit it, we do a survey in there, we install these to allow us to invigorate it, to see what will happen, right? So invigorating these villages is one of the things that actually satisfied me as a researcher in a big way. And we did this by looking at the whole country, for example, GIS of Kenya, we did that, so we know more about Kenya than the Kenyan government would know about it. We know where every school, where every health center is where every stream, where every river and so forth, every roads are, and we do surveys as I mentioned before. So we did an indication what sort of technology we have. If it's a windy place, we can have utilized wind energy. If it's a solar place, where solar is what we utilize solar energy. If there is some rivers or some streams, we can have use of hydropower. But we selected to have solar. So this is the first installation that we did, which is basically a combination of things, okay? It's a hub for the, for the, for the, for the, for the village to, to look around. And the canopy here, where the solar panels are done, is actually collecting rainwater. And that's why you have these tanks. And I can tell you, when I wrote the proposal to get this, I never thought that I'll have my solar panels collect water. Just it came around later on when you visit that. I just asked for a certain amount of money to do installations in those villages. Okay, so how do we work? We connect all the buildings in the village, including health center, the schools, uh, spaces for worship, uh, worship, the, the buildings that are around, like businesses uh, or anything else that's around in the village. And then those services, they, those, those uh, businesses provide services to the rest of the community by having them to come to charge their appliances, their mobile phones, perhaps the lanterns, the radios, and so forth. Uh, and then from this, you can actually go, go, go further. So this is really a meeting with the community where we are demonstrating to them a battery, which you can buy from uh, the, 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 you know, for the supplier across the road from, from the village. And also, um, they can bring it down to be charged, a battery, an inverter, and a solar panel, and a fridge. So people could upgrade it if they wanted to have and have something very, very useful for them. So we developed a community-based project in a way that is not only providing and selling power, but also providing finance. Microfinance is one of the things that was really important at the time. And because you got income coming in from selling of the power, then they can lend people, lend to the farmers, lend to them to do projects, lend to people to open up uh, an ICT school and things like that. Uh, and so basically it's all based on, on the training that we provided for them. So we did the first project in Kenya 2012 and then other ones which are in partnership with the government in Kenya and Uganda. And now we're looking at an approach where these could be scaled up. So we're looking at 325 villages in Uganda, 60 villages in Kenya and we'll see whether we can get some funding for those to be scaled up. So, I've been speaking to you about watts or kilowatts to megawatts and so forth. And I want to take your 
uh, one minute of your time to just show you this video here. Uh, allow me to have a drink of water as well. have some music to it. <laughs> Maybe I should try that next time. So that's really what I, I mentioned at the beginning is that this uh, and a, a system across scales came out because we had the discussion in, in the team to see what we're doing and so forth. So some thoughts were very very quickly uh, to indicate that we need to be much more aware of what's happening around the globe in relation to the population growth and the depletion of resources and how the global society as a whole could come together to address these issues and the climate change negotiation in Paris actually came in and actually gave us a pathway uh, to, to develop this. Uh, we in the UK and actually other places we need to think about energy efficiency as a major component to the delivery of our legislated emissions. This is something that the government should really be aware and actually be reminded to do uh, to allow us to uh, uh, um, address our targets. But there's also an objective for us to balance human well-being uh, uh, and also allow us to make sure that we're not really becoming uh, very, uh, what do you call it, um, Provide, providing solutions that are not acceptable by other communities. Okay, I mentioned the wind farm across quite a lot of the communities. A small number of community members were very mm -hmm. vociferous, yet they stopped that. Okay, but that's part of it. I think we should have done better game than what we've done before. Could we perhaps could this building provide its own power? Why why do we have to get it from somewhere else? Could this campus? think about providing its own, but could be independent, okay? And you, everybody think about the Tesla uh, sort of, uh, um, the guy who's doing the, the whatever his name is, uh, Musk, yeah. who's doing the Tesla, right? Yeah. And he's got the Tesla wall, which is the battery, so but people in the States are thinking about being independent <coughs> of the grid. We should think about that ourselves as well. How do we address power generation, okay? If I'm living in the street and I've got a huge roof, Okay. Could I collaboratively work with my neighbor and say, can we do that together and sell collaboratively within the community our energy that we produce, both at the kilowatt and perhaps the megawatt scale? Is there an optimized energy mix? And this is really what, um, what the Germans are doing because they have to stop their nuclear power plants. They're thinking about this energy mix in terms of only power but heat, both generation and storage. And how could that be? Uh, how could that be utilized to make them balance up the books? Okay, so Germany is really doing quite a lot of the stuff in terms of storage. And to me, we are engineers and scientists and economists and social scientists and so on. We should be taking up the baston to say to the politicians that this, whatever decision they make, this should be embedded in evidence based on science and, and also based on understanding. Okay, is there a way of creating a regional aspect to this? Could Wales work collaboratively, perhaps between its own regions, and also sell power across to Bristol? You never know. And because everything is underpinned by money, we need to think about this fiscal uh, sort of uh, instruments that need to have. For example, across the river, across the Southampton water, we have a 40 megawatt of heat been just pumped to the atmosphere, which with a pipe, utilizing a pipe, you can take it out to a district heating. Right? This is the sort of thing that we know. So how do you create those instruments to allow you to invest in this? 
And how do we enable our citizens to actually to be part of the solution? And that actually is inf information, especially nowadays, in relation to what we have in terms of social media and all this, will allow us to actually interact very well with our people. So sustainable energy across scales, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.